Hello, welcome to this talk with Pat Atkinson. Pat has worked for a number of years um, in India, establishing charitable work out there and a properly registered charity. She's going to talk to us today a bit about the work that she's done and who has given her inspiration. So I'm going to share our slides. So Pat, tell us a little bit about how you got started and what these lovely people represent. All right, well, it, it all started 31 years ago. I can't really believe that amount of time has gone, but I went out with um, a British national organization on what was going to be a one-off fact-finding trip. But I was just, I suppose, it had been in my heart for, for the whole of my life that I wanted to go and work in India. And an opportunity arose as a result of that first trip and then a few other trips to actually work with that original organization, but based in India. Um, and I, I stayed with them for about seven or eight years, but unfortunately there were issues there and problems. And I realized the only way it was going to work was to do it myself. So I started off with, with children, children and education particularly education and and uh, very much education to promote uh, girls was a very important part of, of what we were doing. But the other part of it was that there were a lot of elderly women who, for various reasons, um, literally no family or their children had died, were living on the streets. And so one of the first big projects that we set up was this home. And it is a lovely home. Um, and it's for elderly women who've been on the streets for several years. Um, they come to us in a, an array of, of, of illness and, well, malnutrition, things like elephantitis. They've nearly all, in fact, I think all of them have got TB in one form or another. But we set up this home. We built it ourselves. Um, we registered the charity in India as well as the UK. And that's actually been the most important thing because being registered out there with Indian trustees and Indian management has made all the difference in the world. We're protected in the sense of there are documents drawn up to say that, you know, okay, we're the funders, but there are principles that we adhere to and we expect them to adhere to. But anyway, this is our home. And those are the ladies who actually live there. Um, we, we built it by having the huts or the rooms, there are 36 rooms altogether, sponsored and International Towns Women's Guild did sponsor one of the huts. That so was that was rather special. Yeah. So the, 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 I mean, they look so much better on those on that picture because we've gradually fed them properly, got medical care for them and so on. And they stay with us until they die. There's no way they will ever go back to the streets. Um, we've had to teach them how to lie on beds. Um, they've never had toilets and we've actually got biocompostable toilets. Um, it's, it takes a while for them to adapt to actually being looked after and cared for. But once you start to show them love, the love you'll get back in return is just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So one of my, I can't say favourite bits, of, I love all, everything we do, but I, I'm thrilled with that home. Mm, it's it's amazing. And they, they just, some of those smiles in there, the, 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 there's a lady in the middle, um, towards the back and the broadest of smiles there. It, it just seems so natural. And another lady in the front row, uh, a little lady in the blue sari with a purple. Uh, Lalita, yeah. <laughs> she, she just looks so happy. Um, usually with, uh, with our, our members, when they come together, we get a few very grumpy looking ones because their mouths are permanently turned down. But um, they, these ladies look pleased to be there and pleased to have you amongst them. Yeah, and I love being there. Um, but it, the children, well, it was always going to be children in the beginning. And, and initially we had our own boys and girls home. Um, but they're not necessarily needed in the same way now in India. Things have been, I say, it's 31 years for me, so I've seen a big change. But the government has got a very strong educational, a national educational policy now um, that came into force, particularly in 2020. And um, the idea is that every child should go to school. There are places available for them. It's not always possible 
for every child to access school. I'm, I'm not ignorant about that, but we work in a particular slum um, in this main city in the south of India. And all of these children live in the slum. Now they are going to school, but the trouble is they're going to school hungry. And when they finish school and come home, it's dark. There's no electricity in the slum, no water, no sanitation. So how do they manage to cope with their schoolwork? So they come to us in the morning, they have breakfast. We have three excellent tuition teachers who are ex-slum uh, girls themselves. And they have tuition until they go to school and we give them breakfast. They go to school, the government provides lunch and the government actually does a lot of good. They provide lunch, uniforms, textbooks and so on. Then the children come back to us usually about four, half past four and then they go home and get changed and they come back to us. And from then till usually about nine o'clock at night, they're with us and we've got a generator so that we can make electricity. And we're split into three groups now. We've got so many. This is, this is one of the, that's the second group, have younger ones as well. This is group two. Then we have the older children and uh, we have to squash into small spaces wherever and the generator gets moved, but the teachers are superb. So they're getting an extra five hours tuition a day in actual fact, plus of course in the evening, they get a meal. And then we sponsor all of these children. Um, they're all sponsored by British families. So they know they've got a bit of a future, a chance. And the majority of them, I think we've in the whole of the time we've operated, we've only had two dropouts. They stay with us and they go on. And we're well into almost the, the 200 mark now for graduates children from that slum who've gone through the system with us. I'm not saying they wouldn't have made it anyway. Some of them are extremely bright. But the most important thing is that they've got the opportunity to have the education. But they do need that help morning and evening. And uh, it, it, the sponsorship scheme is absolutely fantastic. They, they actually build up relationships with their sponsors. It, it encourages them so much to know that someone 8,000 odd miles away thinks they're worth investing in. So. The whole scheme has been has been amazing and we would expect every one of those children to be with us for at least eight to nine years and then to go on to higher education or vocational training as the very least and of course doing it this way enables them to stay with their families even though their families may be living under great poverty they're not a burden on their families in terms of being need to be fed or schooling to be paid for um, so they don't need to be pushed into the world of work too soon. Is and that's actually, uh, that's a major factor because um, the fact that children sometimes are pulled out of school into work is because the family just can't cope. If you read the stories behind every one of these children, you'll find that most, well, these are, these are considered socially deprived children, economically um, disadvantaged to use the socially and economically disadvantaged to use the government terminology. They're living in a slum, their parents will be mainly illiterate um, and they'll be earning something in the region of 30 pounds a month. In fact, our criteria is that the child's family income is less than 30 pounds. And um, we ask sponsors to pay us either nine or 10 pounds. Nine pounds covers everything. 10 pounds allows us to put a pound a week away for their for their future and I mean think about that's a third of their family income that we're investing in their children so there's no way they want to drop out at all in fact it's they're a wonderful group uh, the last group of, of children that have just graduated um 12 of them who've actually left the scheme all been with us for at least 11 or 12 years and they formed their own support group for us now and they're actually uh, putting some of their wages into a fund so they can help these children as well and uh, we, you know, we rely on volunteers. Um, I've got minimal staff, really, but um, it's virtually all of our volunteers, 23 registered volunteers are all ex-children who've gone through this system. It says something for the system working that the people want to come back. When you think about children that go through the care system in the UK, which I know is somewhat different, but a lot of those just never want to go back again. Um, this is a very different kind of care, and it's a care that clearly makes them happy as well. 
I hope so. Oh, they are. They're, they're wonderful. I mean, they are incredible children and they really want to learn. This is the, the amazing thing. I mean, the, the, the way of teaching there is totally different to ours. They, they tend to learn a lot by rote. But they, I mean, we follow their, their system. We're not going to try and change the way that the government does it. That's not the right thing to do. Uh, we just try to support what the government is already doing. And I think, you know, for, for these children particularly, I mean, living in a slum, um, and it's, it's not a good slum at all. It's not their fault. Um, but they have no electricity, no water, no sanitation. But at least when they're coming to us, they feel as though they're important. Someone, someone, some uh, a long way away is, is supporting them, and they've got a chance. And they want to be doctors and lawyers and um, real aspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And we encourage it. Why shouldn't they be? And I, I think it's important to point out that you know the fact that there are slums is not necessarily a reflection on government. The government at the moment are trying to do something about it but it's a huge country um, and it's got a long history behind it so slow change will come slowly it will come oh, it will, yeah it, it will it will come i think people underestimate the fact that that well over half i think it's um i'm, I'm not sure the exact figure i think it's about 57 percent of the population is 18 or under and that's 1.2 billion people. Well, it's not going to happen in five minutes. And and in a sense, I, I, I think they are doing their very best. Slum clearance programs are happening and I've watched slums in our city change. Um, but I, I, I did, uh, did my basic degree in sociology and I, I think about the you know, the t in the 50s when, when we tried to change people by taking them out of slum communities in our country and, and, and moving them into other places. They lost their sense of community then. So it's got to be done in a special way. And, and hopefully these children will build up friendships that will last them. Um, and I, I know our slum will be improved eventually. Um, but in the meantime, they, they get fresh water delivered. And all through the pandemic, the, the government has made sure they've all been fed. I mean, we've backed that up with our supplementary feeding as well. But They've not been let down and deserted at all. That's good to hear. Um, this is this is one of our ambulances. We, we work with um, a flagship hospital in the south of India, um, Cancer Hospital, and it, it's a very long story linked a little bit to the fact that my own granddaughter went through a very unpleasant childhood cancer. Um, people, people who have cancer will get their treatment, but they sometimes have to go from extremely far away rural villages to get to this main flagship hospital. The problem is they, they become so sick, they can't manage to get on the public transport or can't afford the public transport to get back for their treatment. So um, a lot of them end up, well, literally dying without pain relief or, or help of, it, of any sort. So we set up the ambulance scheme uh, 18 years ago now, and we've we've completed over 500,000 home and clinic visits since then, taking palliative end of life care. We provide the ambulance, the driver, pay the fuel costs, and the hospital provides the nurses, or hospitals and local churches or organisations provide the nurses. And it's it's been a, an incredible. I mean, I've been out on the ambulance a lot of times. Sometimes it takes you two hours driving to reach this remote rural village where there are no buses anyway. And you've got this poor soul dying in a shack um, with no medical care unless we take the ambulances out. So that's been a very important part of, of what we've done. We're still doing it now. This particular ambulance is actually not doing that in, in that part of uh, the South. It's more in Tamil Nadu. And we, we're now looking after children who've got cancer and the same situation, they're living in isolated rural villages. It's the, the geography that people never grasp really, how far it is to, for some of these people to have to travel. Mm -hmm. And um, our ambulances, two ambulances um, that were sponsored for us by uh, Rotary Clubs. Um, those two ambulances are, are bringing children who can't access treatment otherwise backwards and forwards to um, the city where our slum is based for their treatment. So we're all together running um, two ambulances in 
the Kerala area that are going out to older people and two ambulances in Tamil Nadu for children. So four ambulances running at the moment. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm sure many of our viewers will have experienced um, life-limiting illness uh, and know the importance of tra travel being laid on for them and to get them to and from appointment. We're now at your farm with the chickens and you've mentioned that um, some of them end up in the pot, some of them are layers. Uh, you were just beginning to say about how useful it was during the pandemic. Mm, it, it meant we, we had a supply of fresh eggs that was going to carry on and the chicken meat, of course. So that did help us because we did provide food for all of our elders and children. Um, well, we're still providing them on a daily basis through the pandemic. So having the farm, um, it's not a big farm, it's less than an acre, but we've got the chickens and three cows. Um, we started out with two. Unfortunately, one of them gave birth to a female. And so we get milk as well. And that is, is amazing. And what we've done, and I'm, I'm really quite, I don't like using the word proud, but I am proud of it. it we, we couldn't keep the original goats we planned to keep because there was no water to grow the grass. But we've actually started a hydroponic system um, and we managed to grow our own grass now and just enough for those three cows. But those three cows give enough milk for the children to have a, a cup of milk at least three times a week each. So it's a, it's a small concern, but it, it, it's, it's actually invaluable to us because we've got meat, eggs and milk all being provided from this little tiny piece of land, which is less, less than an acre in a drought area where there's no water. So it's quite, quite, quite amazing, really. You, you say it's a drought area. How long has the drought been going on for? Well, it, it, it's quite remarkable. Um, when I first went out of there, out there 30, 31 years ago, you couldn't cross the river that divides the city um, at certain times of the year when the monsoon was on, but that river has been totally dry for about 14 years. So they do get a bit of rain but there, there's no water in the underground streams. You can't, it's pointless trying to sink a ball well in that area now, there's just nothing there. In fact, the World Health Organization thinks that in 50 years where we're based now, will one day, be, will just be desert because there's just no water. So um, the government provides water tanks three times a week and that's the only water the people in the slum have got access to. Um, we're very lucky in this area where we, there was actually on this farm when we bought it, there was an existing bore well, but we only get about six litres of water a day. And that's all we can get from that bore well. And, and we're very fortunate to get that. But every time I go out to the farm, I see the trucks trundling around with the government water because so many people just have no water at all. Well, one of the most telling things for me was, um, we're nine hours from the coast by train, but we took our children to the sea and one of uh, and the old ladies and one of the ladies when she went into the sea said to me this is the first time in my life i've been in water and that sums it up it, it, it's serious and mm. it, i mean we get a bit of rainfall during the year but it, it'll rain for a couple of days and then stop um the days of the monsoon lasting for weeks at a time have completely gone uh, in our area that is mm. It's really a, a, a certain sign of climate change there, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't understand the technicalities of climate change, but I've seen it with my own eyes. I mean, 31 years and going from what it used to be to what it is now is quite, quite well, it frightens me, to be honest. Mm. Really worrying. Kerala is totally different. You know, Kerala's got water and paddy fields, but you, you just do that nine hour journey to where we are and there's nothing. Um, I just put this picture in because this is one of our latest graduates. He, he, he graduated from university uh, with a BCom, Bachelor of Commerce, and came back to say, I just took that picture because uh, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of them all. I mean, they're lovely, lovely children. Yeah. I think you, you have honorary grandmother status there by the looks of things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is one of our ladies actually in the slum who became very sick um she had a bit of an accident and had to have a leg amputated 
And of course, there was no one to care for her, but we did care for her. She wouldn't come into our home, unfortunately. Um, but we looked after her in her shack, but she sadly died. But at least we did look after her. And that's typical of the sort of home they live in. Um, this is one of the children who's got cancer. Um, this little girl lives in an isolated rural village and she can't walk. And again, to get to the hospital, which is about four hours away on the bus, how does she get to the hospital? Well, she can't, it's as simple as that. So we take the ambulance out and pick her up now and take her in for a treatment. Um, she's improved a lot. She's had to have an amputation. Unfortunately, there are quite radical um, actions are taken sometimes to try and arrest and cure cancers. But she's just one of the many that we do transport because otherwise they would not reach the hospital. Um, the little hospital we're working with, a small, this is a small um, country hospital, not the main cancer centre where, where we run two of the ambulances. Um, they say that every year, probably they diagnose 4,000 odd children and probably a third of them never come for treatment because they just can't access the hospital. So our ambulances are in, playing an increasingly important part um, in looking after them. This is our football team. Um, I'm a big Norwich City supporter. Um, I don't know why, but I am. Um, and uh, we wanted the children to access the things that other children are doing just because they belong to um, a slum community. It shouldn't mean they can't you know, become part of football leagues. Um, so some friends got married and they, forgo they said they wouldn't have wedding presents. They'd have the money instead um, for football. So we bought them their kit. So they're in Norwich City colours there. Um, but with our logo on the on the front of their shirts. That's the boys team. And we have a girls team because why shouldn't girls have the same opportunity as the boys? Uh, there wasn't a girls league and there still isn't a girls league though they're thinking about forming one now. So our girls have to play against the boys. Uh, so in the bottom division, but they still play. And um, this is our five-a-side girls team, uh, the group that pays in the five-a-side team. And we're encouraging that just as much. And it's quite unusual to see a girl in shorts mm. in India, but there we are. That's our girls football team. And of course, internationally, India, uh, Indian women do take part in quite a lot of competition, don't they? Yes, they do. And, and that's got to be encouraged. I, I think um, th these girls are actually quite good. Mm. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, Another thing we do, and I suppose the thing that one maybe always wanted to go to India was to work with people with leprosy. As a nine-year-old, I used to go around collecting permission to lepers. Um, and that was something that was very important to me that eventually when I went there, I'd be working with people with leprosy. And originally, when I should have gone to India after my nurse training before I was ill and couldn't go, um, I was going to work on a lepros uh, lep leprosy colony. Anyway, we, we now support this colony ourselves. It's got 36 families and they've all had their main leprosy treated and they've been semi-discharged, but of course they can't work. I mean, this lady, as you can see, has lost a leg. She's got no use of her hands whatsoever. And actually it's a table leg tied uh, attached to her stump. There. So we've looked after this colony now for 12 years and um, they're just the most incredibly wonderful people, but they're quite badly disfigured and people are terrified of leprosy. And um, I'm saying this very, very carefully because I don't want to sound like some crazy mother Teresa, but going in and actually hugging them and touching them and being with them, it, it just sh tries to show other people that there's nothing to be frightened of. Um, it's not something, I mean, people say, even people in India, when they see these pictures, they say, how can you touch that person? They go, why shouldn't I? I'm not going to catch leprosy. But there, there's this big stigma and fear attached to it still. So it's only a small colony, uh, but I'm absolutely thrilled that we, we work with these people and I absolutely adore them. Um, I, one of my favourite times when I'm there is to just go and be there with them. And there's this wonderful sense of peace and calm in the colony that just absolutely delights me. Um, this is Kaya Pai, another leprosy sufferer. Now she actually was in the slum. She would never ever go to the colony. Um, the most incredible lady who just, I mean, she couldn't walk. 
she shuffled to our center for her lunch every day because we run a lunch center i haven't mentioned that but we do run a lunch center in the slum as well and she, she used to shuffle there on her bottom she could never walk and her family wouldn't let her live inside the hut that they had even though it was a very tiny hut they made her sleep on a piece of corrugated cardboard outside but we gave her lunch every day and um, i totally and utterly fell in love with this lady um, she was the first person I used to see when I got to India and the, and the last person I'll see before I left. Um, never complained, never grumbled, never asked for anything. Just incredibly grateful for, the, for what we gave her. But um, I, I felt an incredible amount of love for her. Sadly, she has died. And I think that's the nearest I've come to, to feeling, underst I understand what being broken hearted means. Broke my heart when she died. Incredible soul. Um, we're back in the leprosy colony. <laughs> the, the leprosy family have children, of their families have children and grandchildren, and in a sense, they too are rather ostracized. So, um, we had a series of Christmas parties in the slum with the, with the different educational groups, and then we have this group also in the leprosy colony, and we go there every Saturday and we show them films and play games with them. And our, our own other children increasingly come out to be with them as well, so that they can see these people, these children should not be ostracized. Um, so this is their way of saying thank you to their, their friends in England. Put this in to show this, the, the toilet in the slum, that, that is it, it's a sewer. There's no toilet. The government made a promise when they were elected that they would put toilets in every slum. And, and every make sure every people had access to toilets. They've put three toilets in our slum, but they're useless because they can't be plumbed in. There's no there's no underground water to, fl to, to so you can't flush the toilets. You can't flush the waste away. Um, in our in our care home, we have actually got toilets. They're biocompostable, and that's how we operate those. But this is it in the slum. There's 600 people living there, and that's the toilet, and that's where our children. Are living. Gosh. <laughs> this, 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 well, uh, her name, it, her, it, she's another one actually with the same name as the leprosy lady, Kaya Pai. Uh, she's the lady I personally sponsored. Um, mm -hmm. she, she can, she learned two words of English, Pongal Pongal, and, and the Pongal is actually a, a Tamil festival. Um, but I sponsored her for four or five years. Um, she'd had the most horrendous life she'd been on the on the streets for five years when the police brought her to us um but again a most adorable lovely lady never complained never grumbled and just you know just so thankful all the time mm -hmm. for for what we'd given her we we're able to give her um and again every one of those ladies sponsored and it makes such a difference to them to know that, that someone cares for them yeah. and that they are going to be looked after and she has again tragically since that photo was taken, she's died last year, end of last year, not from the pandemic, just literally died of old age. And that's marvellous, in a sense, that somebody is dying of old age when they may have been, their life may have been considerably foreshortened. Well, they... To think of her dying on the streets, and, and I mean, you see very few on the streets now because the government has set up a scheme to keep old people off the streets. Uh, they're setting up a series of dormitories now for them. But to me, to, to die without anyone caring for you, uh, we've had several of our ladies have died through the years. Of course, we, we've had the home running now for nine years, um, but they've always died with the other ladies with them. And we arranged their funerals. That's good. Oh, back in the leprosy colony. This is Krishna. Um, you're not supposed to have favorites, but here he is. <laughs> uh, Krishna is just lovely. He's he's quite a young man actually, but he's got very severely deformed hands and feet. Um, he's recovered from his leprosy, but it's it's also in his lungs, and he's probably not got a very good prognosis. But um, he, I, I again, I'm just very very fond of him. I, I, it's so easy not it's so so hard not to fall in love with these people and just care about them because they they are so lovely and. Um, so unassuming and just grateful for anything that's that's given to them. Do we still see young people developing leprosy? 
Mm. Not quite so much. I think there's a lot more understanding of, of what leprosy is. And there are lots of notices and signs around saying, you know, these are the signs. But I think because the stigma attached to it still, people are reluctant to go forward for treatment. Um, the last figure I saw was that they're expecting 120,000 new cases in the next year in, in the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Um, and they're trying an educational thing at the moment to make people realise that the earlier they catch it, the better. But um, the trouble is a lot of people don't have access to medical treatment anyway, so they don't even understand sometimes. You know, if you're walking barefoot on the streets and you haven't got shoes and you get sores on your feet, you don't know that that sore is actually the beginning of leprosy. That's the problem. That's that sort of problem. They don't. It's ignorance and misunderstanding. But that's Krishna. He's lovely. Um, this is another lady in a, another project we run. It, it's a small rural village um, way out in, in the wilds. It takes us, um, well, four hours on the main road and then two more hours down um, dried up riverbeds to get to her village. They've got no water out there at all. And the local um, lovely little mission hospital run by um, two doctors who used to work in the UK and have moved back to their own area. And they said, well, I, I don't want to go into details, but old people were disappearing because the families just couldn't afford to feed them and look after them. And uh, some quite horrendous stories I've heard. So we've adopted that village and we take out food bags on a monthly basis for them, including water. Um, so far, we do 32 food bags every month. So it's oil and grains and the old person gets the food bag as long as they're alive. If they die, then the family doesn't get the food bag. And there's a, a, you can read between the lines on that one. Yes. So they will look after them. So we do that on a monthly basis and it, it's not expensive. It's about nine pounds for a month's supply of food for them. Mm. And uh, we've been doing that for four years now, nearly five, but it's a, a horrendous journey to get to them. Actually, their village is very close to the source of the main river that feeds the city that we're working in. And there's nothing there, it's just white sand. There's, there's no water in, the, in the, the outlet at all. So the starting point of that river just, is just totally dry. Another sign of climate change or just how bad the drought is in that area. They, they, they've got nothing, they've got one little tiny area where some water trickles through they have to sieve the sand to get the water out of it but it's nowhere near enough for the old people in the village as well and they're the ones who sadly will die you know, this is one of them none of them can read or write um when we deliver their food bags we we like to have evidence so they give us a thumbprint uh -huh. and we're back with our, our ladies again <laughs> Uh, actually, three of these ladies did come from that village. We persuaded them to come to us because they didn't have anyone else um, to look after them. But that, that's back to our, our lovely selves. Um, they look nicely dressed. It's because when they're sponsored, the sponsorship covers the cost of two saris a year. So birthday and Christmas, they get a new sari and a pair of sandals. And they're actually persuading them to wear sandals when they've never had the shoes. is not that easy. But that's back with our lovely old people again. That's at Christmas time, I think, or just close to Christmas. We've got some light and some decorations up. They're all clutching little bags. Yeah, there was a lovely lady in Norwich um, and she made what she called bags of love. Right. And uh, she, she made these by hand and embroidered a little heart on each one and put a small bar of soap and a toothbrush. Uh, though I, I didn't like to tell her that most of them haven't got teeth, but that's another story. Um, and uh, a comb and a little smelly thing in for them. And uh, they are called bags of love. They've all got them, they love them. I've just been dishing them out, handing them over. Splendid. And somebody else has just been receiving presents too. By the yeah. this, is, uh, this is recent, this is this Christmas that's just gone. Uh, Christmas, oh, you can see on the, on, the, on the sign at the back there. Um, all of our people got presents at Christmas. These are the children with cancer who were inpatients at the time. Uh, we're looking after 36 at the moment. These are the inpatients of that group. Mm -hmm. um, and they've never had toys or gifts. So again, we all, they all got a, a Christmas gift as did all the leprosy people and the people in the slum 
and our children who, who were educating. So we made sure they all got a gift at Christmas time. Um, and as you can see, the masks are being worn partly for the pandemic, but partly because they're all undergoing chemotherapy. Lovely. lovely children again <laughs> children love toys full stop oh yes um these are our, some of our our children from the slum center who we actually took out to the leprosy colonies that was a sort of a joint meeting um they wanted to see a star wars film and we put up a big sheet and we've got a projector so uh, to see the Star Wars film where we ran it in the colony, so they came out to the colony. But again, it's it's an educational thing. It's done deliberately to make our children realise that that this is a, a very unpleasant and difficult illness, but that there's nothing to fear from catching it from the people there. Yeah, and, and that you know other children enjoy the same things that they do. Oh, they absolutely. Same treats. Yeah. Oh, dear. Ah, uh, no, well, well, we run a sewing unit. Um, long as a long, complicated story, but a, a, a lovely lady who used to be uh, one of the um, oh dear, sorry, dis district guider, district commissioner for guides mm -hmm. uh, in in my area died, and her family gave us enough money as a result of her funeral to start the sewing a sewing project, mm -hmm. and um. That ran for quite a while, very successfully. We have batches of ladies coming in. They're mainly from the slum, but some from outside. They're girls who've had to drop out of school early. So it's quite hard for them to be uh, to, to earn a living. So by training them in, se in sewing machinery, um, they can actually then earn, uh, earn money. Um, when I said the government gives the children uniforms, provides school uniforms, it does. It gives them the cloth actually, not the uniform itself. So. There's a, there's a source of money making there. But anyway, one of the things they really wanted was an embroidery machine and they're quite expensive. But again, thanks to um, a very generous donation from, from some friends, uh, we were able to buy this embroidery machine. So you can see by their faces, they're delighted to have it. They've been waiting for it for about six months and now, now they can do a lot more. So as a result of the embroidery machine, we're able to now make some embroidery gifts that we, we're beginning to very, we can't technically sell because of customs duty of getting things into this country. But mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, my, my, what I call my home church is on Exmoor and uh, they sell handkerchiefs that the, the ladies make. So we're gradually, we're, we're producing things now that, that just to make them see that you can actually, if you work, mm -hmm. earn something. So they do, six months training with us. We have six in the morning, six in the in the afternoon. So we've got 12 in training, so 24 a year. And it's our fifth year of running now. And they can come back in the evening to use the machines. Well, and um, this is a, another project. Um, these are sort of a, a, a leaf you can only get in India that's been dipped in acid and made into a gossamer. And the children do that, very careful with the acid. And then they stick the leaf onto cards and they hand paint them. And um, again, we've been producing these for quite a while now. We can't produce them on a big enough um, scale to sell a lot, but they make the cards that go to our all their sponsors, all the sponsors at Christmas time and birthdays and so on. And again, my 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 church does sell some for us, but invariably they are their cards that they're making for the sponsors. But girls and boys, again, and we. They cost us about probably 120 to produce, and that includes 40 pence for each of the children. Whom, so if a child hand paints the card, does, does the card work, then they get 40p. And the boy at the back um, on the back row's uh, right-hand side, he, he's actually one of our biggest workers on that project, and he, he's earning enough money to his mother to have stopped climbing into industrial waste bins to, to clean them, which was what her job was, because he's earning enough money from his cards. It's marvellous. So again, it's an incentive. Ah, and there are the cards. So now you know where my church is. And uh, these are, so they make them especially for the church and they sell them. And um, mm. just an example of how the embroidery machine has changed things. I don't know how much further we can go on with this. I've got I've got about 200 at the moment available. We can't, as I say, 
there are customs implications, unfortunately, to bringing things over, but they're, they're just delighted to be able to make them. That's pretty much the end of your presentation. I, I found it extremely interesting. Um, you've mentioned the issues with COVID and, and the way that the, the government has acted positively, but you've been stepping in to support those that need a little more help. Um, mm. And you've mentioned climate change as well. Where do you, where do you see the projects going in the future? Do you, do you have ambitions? Um, to be honest, I'm quite worried about the future because I, th I don't see any sign of the water problem easing. I think it's getting worse, not better. And that, that is a bit of a worry. Um, so I am a bit worried about that. Uh, I, I don't know in the longer term where the projects will go. I mean, we've got to continue education for the children. That's the most important thing. We're educating people about what leprosy really means in an indirect way. And we've got a very good relationship in our city with the police and the authorities. We're registered properly with all the local authority regulations, we meet them. We're, we're registered with the social services department and we do everything we can. And we're trying that way to show a different way perhaps of, of, of uh, reaching out to people. Um, but in the longer term, I am worried about the, the future. I'm trying because of age is catching up on me. I mean, you know, I, I was 42 when I first went out, 73 now. So. Um, I've got to think about the future, but the staff I've got are superb. Two of the boys we picked up from the streets when they were four and seven years old, and they've now got master's degrees. We've educated them, and they're two of my main staff members now. So they are committed and understanding more than anyone of what's going on. My main manager out there, Motokuma, is the most incredible man. He's my best friend in the world. Um, and and in incredibly hard working and very committed and dedicated so I know that they they can manage uh, eventually we might have to sell our home and sell the farm and we will probably concentrate our work much more on the children with cancer because for me if a child has cancer having gone through that with my own granddaughter to know that they are there and the treatment is available they can't access it is, is a really really worrying thing but this is again about climate change you know that they've got no water in the villages and people say well they should go and sink bore wells but what people don't understand is that some of the villages you have to travel miles and miles to get to them i went out one day on the our, our ambulance to see children who got cancer in their local villages and it took us 12 hours to visit seven children and most of that was down dried up riverbeds, uh, almost impassable roads to get to these children, to take them, because again, they get monthly food bags and allowances um, to pick up a couple to take to, to hospital. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing project. I, I, think that, I think the government is trying so hard to alleviate the problem, but it's a huge problem over a huge geographical area and they're fighting climate change as much as they are other other issues like um, I don't know how do you educate that number of children? It's it's totally mind boggling, isn't it? Mm. Now this series of talks are all about writing women into history, and I'm absolutely convinced that your name should be firmly written in the history books. But do you have some any? women that you want to see recorded in the history books? Yeah, probably one very famous one, but two that no one will have ever heard of and are never likely to. Um, one was a young girl whose father had been visited by ambulances in Kerala, uh, taking him palliative care until he died. But the fact that he died and her mother was very sick with TB meant that she had to give up school. Um, she couldn't carry on. And she was absolutely devastated. She was a very bright girl. But anyway, um, it wasn't us that supported her. We, did, we gave an initial lump sum of £200 to, keep, to pay her college fees for a year. And they found local sponsors, because Indian people do help a lot. 
local sponsors for her and that girl carried on with her education that's going back 25 years now she's now deputy head of a school so a girl very poor Dalit untouchable girl from a village whose father died whose mother had TB who had to drop out of school at 14 is now deputy head of a school uh, that girl inspires me a lot because she she was determined to do it another girl uh, and I've no idea who she was or, or where she came from. And I've got this image in my mind. I, I can picture her to this day. I, I was just driving along in our vehicle and she was walking by on the other side of the road. There, there was no one else about. She was probably about 10, 11 years old. And all she had on was a pair of dark brown, dirty looking, almost knickers come shorts. I don't know what they were. It's all she had on, no shoes. But this girl, her head was up, her chest was out, and she was striding along as so though to say, I am not going to let the world defeat me. And you know, that, that picture has stayed in my mind because I think most of these children are like that. They just want the opportunity to, to be able to get on and do something with their lives. I've no idea what happened to her. And I wish now that I'd stopped and found out who she was, but I've never lost that image. Mm -hmm. And the, the famous one was I was very privileged to actually meet Mother Teresa um, in her little bedroom. Um, she was very interested to know how we managed to access the slum that we're working in, because apparently um, it's been quite a hard one to get into. But you know, we, we're there now. And uh, it was a, a four day journey to Calcutta to get to her. And she was very sick when we got had to wait three days. I went round and saw all the work that she does, all her own projects in Calcutta. And then eventually I was able to go into her bedroom. And it was about six by eight. There was room for the bed that she was lying on and just a bucket on the floor and a glass of water. That's all she had, no belongings. And uh, I was with her for a very short time. She was just too sick to have visitors. I was really privileged to see her at all. Um, but she was an inspiration in India and I was there when she died in India and the whole of India came to a standstill for her funeral. All the shops shut out of a, an act of respect, the, sh the streets were deserted and people were everywhere trying to cram into, well, in fact I had to get a hotel room in the end to, to find a television to watch her funeral and it was around about the same time as, as um, Princess Diana died that there was a bit of a furore in India when the British press was saying that Diana was like Mother Teresa. I said, no, she wasn't. Mother Teresa was a, a person of her own. But having seen her projects, and she epitomised the fact that, that she's just an ordinary person. That's all I am. You know, all of us can reach out like she does and did. You don't have to go to India to do it. I think that maybe this pandemic, more than anything, has shown us that we can actually be there for each other. Um, the volunteering, the, the wonderful amount of, of support that people have been giving um, in this country since the pandemic started just shows that this is, this is what it is all about, loving one another. I'm, I'm not, I will never ever proselytize or, or try to, to, to preach to people, but it, you know, my faith does matter to me. And what we were told was to love each other. We weren't told anything more complicated than that, just love each other. And I've been privileged to love, and I really have loved them, some of the most wonderful, wonderful people in India and here. And the biggest thing I can say is thank you as well to those who've supported us through this 31 year journey, because thanks to them, and again, please don't take this as being boastful, but hundreds of children have had an education and probably several hundred old ladies are no longer living on the streets. And that's thanks to our people. That's love in action. And that's what we're all about. And that's what the world needs to, to think about a lot more. I don't think I can say anything more to follow that other than thank you, Pat. It's great to have you as a supporter of TG, and I hope Thank you. our ladies will support you. Thank you very much.